Um, first, I'd like to begin by saying what a pleasure and a treat it is for me to be able to talk to Ada about her wonderful book. I was lucky enough to read it in an early form, and it is remarkably unchanged in its finished form. She is infuriatingly that good of a writer. Um, and I think we're going to start, Ada's going to read a poem by Frank O'Hara, and then a bit from her book, and then um, we'll ask some questions. Does that sound good? Okay, I thought, um, I was just at the, the grave, my husband and I just drove out to Springs, to Frank O'Hara's grave, um, I got that. and I thought it would be a nice Sorry. kind of benediction oh. to start off um, with a, a poem. So I just, um, more or less at random, I picked steps. How funny you are today, New York, like Ginger Rogers in swing time, and St. Bridget steeple leaning a little to the left. Here I've just jumped out of a bed full of V-Days, I got tired of D-Days, and blue you there still accepts me foolish and free. All I want is a room up there and you in it, and even the traffic halt so thick is a way for people to rub up against each other, and when their surgical appliances lock, they stay together for the rest of the day. What a day. I go by to check a slide and I say, that painting's not so blue. Where's Lana Turner? She's out eating, and Garbo's backstage at the Met. Everyone's taking their coat off, so they can show a rib cage to the rib watchers. <laughs> and the park's full of dancers and their tights and shoes in little bags, who are often mistaken for worker outers at the West Side Y. <laughs> Why not, the Pittsburgh Pirates shout, because they won. And in a mm -hmm. sense, we're all winning, we're alive. Mm -hmm. The apartment was vacated by a gay couple who moved to the country for fun. They moved a day too soon. Even the stabbings are helping the population explosion, though in the wrong country. And all those liars have left the UN, the Seagram buildings no longer rivaled in interest. Not that we need liquor, we just like it. <laughs> and the little box is out on the sidewalk next to the delicatessen so the old man can sit on it and drink beer and get knocked off it by his wife later in the day while the sun is still shining. Mm. Oh God, it's wonderful mm. to get out of bed mm. and drink too much coffee and smoke too many cigarettes and love you so much. It's from 1961. Um, and then I, okay, okay. <laughs> Um, and then I thought I would just read a page of the book about when I found, when I was given that book. Just to set it up. <laughs> In one of my mother's efforts to have my father pay more attention to me, she sent him out to get me something. He came back from the Strand bookstore with a stack of books, including W.H. Auden's The Dyer's Hand and Frank O'Hara's Lunch Poems. I read the Auden book and I liked it, but it went over my head. I was nine and I hadn't yet developed a high tolerance for literary exegesis. <laughs> Lunch poems, though, that I loved right away. Whatever my father and I had in common that was good, I believed, was contained in that little orange and blue book from 1964, the Pocket Poet series number 19. The poems seem simple. They've been described as I do this, I do that poems, but they had a substructure and a music to them. People who dismissed them as light or frothy were fools, I thought. The poems were simple like the Psalms are simple. The more times you repeat them, the more they reveal not just the meaning of the words, but the message of the sound. They were about TV and Coke, coffee and movie stars, and yet they felt like incantations. My father had given me this book, which meant he wanted me to share in this thing he loved. He offered me so little of himself, but this gift was important and felt protective like a talisman. I could carry it around in my backpack and read it on city buses, and it could remind me that my father might not pay that much attention to me, but deep down, we understood each other. By loving his favorite writer, I could honor him, the way other children might honor their father by joining his business. From then on, I had O'Hara's poems in my head. That's 35 years of feeling possessed by him. When I finally saw him in a PBS special, talking and walking and typing, I recognized his gait and his voice and his hands as if he were an old friend, even though I'd only ever seen pictures of him in books and never heard him speak. His friend, the poet Ron Padgett, called O'Hara's a voice that often reminded me of bourbon and smoke, nightclubs, a phone call that changes your life and warmth. To me, he sounded like New York, libraries, and my dad. So for anyone who may not know, tell us who your dad is. Oh, my dad is an art critic. His name is Peter Sheldahl. He writes still for the New Yorker magazine. And you are an only child. Correct. It's you, your mom, and your dad. Yes. At what age did you come to realize that your father was a prominent writer? I, from from the earliest earliest days, he was um, he. Every time people saw my name, they would say, "Oh, are you related to the great art critic Peter Sheldahl?" Because my legal last name is Sheldahl. It's mm -hmm. very distinctive. It has a J in it, 
Um, <laughs> and it is extremely hard to spell and pronounce uh, mm -hmm. for people. And so they, it was, there was no hiding. And that is actually why I changed my name when I was in college, um, because when I started writing. So the book begins with this really, well, I don't know if it properly begins this way, but the, 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 the real narrative for me begins when you find these boxes of your father's containing audio interviews about Frank O'Hara with many of the artists from this area who came here and, and you decide you're going to do what your father could not do. So talk a little bit about why you think that clicked into place for you at that moment. What yeah. was going on where you thought, I'm going to beat you at this? <laughs> <laughs> Lo lovingly. Lovingly, right, of course. Lovingly love. trounced you, yes. Right. <laughs> um, well, so it was, yeah, it was 2018 in the fall. It was in my parents' basement on St. Mark's Place in East Village. Um, and I was looking for a toy for my baby goddaughter. And I found, a, uh, it was like a shoebox, really, of cassette tapes. And yeah, it had names like Larry Rivers and Jane Freilicker um, and Patsy Southgate. And so all the people, by the way, whose graves, or many of them whose graves I just visited, um, out in Springs. Um, and uh, yeah, so I found the box. and. I was shocked because this was an amazing material and it was just sitting gathering dust in the basement. So I brought it to my father and I said, you know, what is all this? And he said, I don't even want to look at it, like get it away from me. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, how, what, how is that possible? Um, he said he was embarrassed. He had never finished this biography of Frank O'Hara. He was contracted to write in 1976, the year I was born. And he had not finished it and, um, and always thought he should have. And I am brought in often as a, fixer for books. This is like one of, this is my day job, is to um, to ghostwrite and to fix things. Um, I've been called um, more than once Mr. Wolf, who is the murder cleanup specialist from Pulp Fiction. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as soon as I saw all this material and I heard that this book needed to be finished, I, it was like the Metallica song Enter Sandman sort of playing very loudly in my head. I was like going to be the relief pitcher. I was like going to come in and just close it out. Um, <laughs> And I said, you know, can I, can I do this? Will you let me just take it? And he was like, just take it away. I don't even care what you do. Go ahead. Um, and that's when I started working on it, convinced, very sure, that I would succeed where he had failed. Right. And you write also, I mean, one of the remarkable things about this book, I think, is the level of candor that you express in terms of a complicated father-daughter relationship. And you write about your dad sort of being the star, the tortured artist who is given every possible license that there is. And you, as sort of the good girl, the hard worker, you hit your deadlines, you don't complain. As you say, your day job is you fix things and then you disappear, mm -hmm. you know? So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you were hoping to accomplish, not just by maybe finishing the book, there was probably some larger things going on, whether you were cognizant or not at the time. Um, yeah, I don't think I was fully conscious of how much I wanted to win and mm -hmm. um, and and how kind of competitive I, I felt in that way. Um, yes, I was always the one who was like, yeah, hitting deadlines, good girl, teacher's pet, all these things. And, um, and my father is a brilliant writer. I mean, that's the other thing too. He was always this star in the sky, just genius. And so I thought I could never, I could never be as good as him. But then I thought but this is something I could do, and it had to do with temperament and personality. So one of the reasons why he didn't finish the book, he told me, was because he had lost the permission from the estate to quote from O'Hara's material, um, and he had lost permission because he had offended uh, the executor, who was the younger sister of Frank O'Hara. And I thought, of, of course you did, because you're, you know, you're difficult. Guess who's not difficult? <laughs> this guy. And so I was sure that I could charm her. We would be sitting having tea um, in no time, and she would think, you know, of course you can do whatever you want. I, uh, I believe that for a very long time. It's wonderful how you sort of bring the reader along with this. This, you know, there are sort of three people in this triangle. It's it's you, your dad, and Maureen, who is Frank O'Hara's sister and the gatekeeper. And at one point, you write about uh, an, sort of an acolyte of your father's, who I want to ask you about as well, <laughs> suggesting to you that you read Janet Malcolm's The Silent Woman, which is her sort of her retelling of her attempts to investigate Sylvia Plath, become her biographer, 
and she is stymied by a gatekeeper, Ted Hughes's sister. And I, I wanted to ask you what you make of, you know, it's so interesting, the sort of parallel between these two women, siblings or a sister-in-law who become gatekeepers and, and make you sort of justify yourself as a writer, as a biographer. I mean, you reprint this great transcript where she is just coming at you hard. And she is saying things like, who are you? And you don't have what it takes. And, and, and you really hold your own. But talk to me a bit about that experience. Um, it was, I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, but it was extremely liberating. So when I failed to do the same thing that my father tried to do, then I had to do something different, which is what the book is. It's a kind of bizarre hybrid model. Right. But I think that the estate, um, the power estates have over the legacy of poets and artists is, um, I had no idea. I didn't really understand what that meant, what that was about. Um, and and I thought, of course, everybody just should, everybody gets to do everything. Yes, you have to apply, you have to fill out the form, but then they give you permission because don't they want things out in the world? Everybody wants things out in the world. Um, reading The Silent Woman, reading a few other books about estates, that were closed off for various reasons, um, and then that's not true, and often the executor thinks they're protecting um, the person, the, the, um, the writer or the artist from something, and it's, and sometimes it's psychological, like, and maybe they're right. Um, in this case, I don't, I don't know that protecting people from knowing that he was gay is actually like a feasible um, strategy. <laughs> <laughs> um, he wrote many poems about having sex with men. <laughs> he titled poems things like homosexuality. <laughs> so, I mean, she tried for a very long time, uh, I think, to, to keep that keep that a secret. Um, but I think what she also brings to the fore, and she probably didn't even know she was doing this, was something you're getting at, which is the importance of biography. I mean, you're writing a biography here on multiple levels. It's a memoir. It's a biography of, of your father to an extent. It's a biography of New York at a certain two specific times, his time and, and your time as a young woman, which is extremely specific and beautifully evoked. Um, and I believe even as, as you quote Frank O'Hara is saying, like, what else is there to write about? The parties and what people were doing and who was sleeping with who? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, the, so the questions that the executor asked me were, many of them were very good questions. It was things like, you know, why, why do this? Why dredge up unpleasant memories? Mm -hmm. um, why talk about your father? If you have something to work it out, work it out privately. Uh, don't work it out on the page and don't bring Frank into it. Um, and I just, I had to really reckon with those questions and whether I agreed with her or not. And I had to actually realize that I didn't, did not agree with her, that I thought biography does have some kind of value, memoir has value, because you see how other people live their lives and you can make decisions about what you do with your own life um, with that information. It's, I, I find them helpful and soothing, personally. Agreed. <laughs> Very much agreed. Um, you write really, really well, and I, I was so gratified to see this because I think it's something that's often uh, ignored when you, when you look at the art world or you get in any way a little bit close to it. And um, the money quote, basically, from Ada is, these people are awful. <laughs> and it's just, um, I think you're talking about Larry Rivers, and you write about among his other issues, his bird murdering and his wife beating. I think Willem de Kooning was the bird murderer. Oh, sorry, de Kooning was the bird murderer. Yes, yeah, sorry. And the wife beater, and then no, Larry, sorry. Larry was taking teenage girls to the zoo and having sex with them. Yeah. Right, okay, sorry, um, my bad. Um, uh, but you know, when... <laughs> but you, you write about these, um, these lost children of the art world, you know? And, and um, Luke, who really regarded Frank as a surrogate father, you know, and Frank's uh, really his love of children and how the art world has, and tell me whether you think it's specific to that world or what, but there's a sort of um, a disregard for norms that really even extend to, to, to raising children. What is that about? I mean, I think I understand a, a lot of it, which is if you have to push really hard against the, the way you grew up, um, and my father did, he grew up in the Midwest, the oldest of five children, um, with an inventor father and a housewife mother, you have, to, you have to push hard to make this new life. 
Um, what I was really struck by in those tapes, though, was learning about Frank O'Hara and how he fought his upbringing, which was in Grafton, Massachusetts. Um, and he pushed back and, and moved to the city. My father copied him. Frank O'Hara was his hero. And he copied some of it. He copied the drinking, the smoking, um, the parties, the beautiful writing. These were things that he took from Frank O'Hara. But then I, I learned something he didn't know, which was Frank O'Hara. He had food fights with children. Mm -hmm. He helped them with their homework. Mm -hmm. um, he, at one point, reads an entire manuscript by a child about a medieval dog named Arf and gives notes on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he's, he's a wonderful man. I mean, he taught, he taught kids how to swim. He'd swim with them in the ocean for hours and hours. And when I learned about that, it made me rather sad because I thought, you know, you, you push back on how you grew up and then you choose what new life to make, and I, and, I, and I read that and I thought, why didn't you include that too in your, in your emulation of Frank O'Hara? Why, why lose that part? Did you ever think of formally interviewing your father for the book? I, you know, I, I sat him down several times. One is when I, when I first had this idea, this um, Girl Scout idea of, you know, coming to the rescue and helping him across the street to finish this book. Um, I sat him down at Odessa, which is our favorite diner on Avenue A. Uh, and, I, and I asked him what had gone wrong, and I showed him some of the, the books I'd already found, and I was so proud of myself. And, uh, and it was a really interesting conversation, because one of the things he said in that uh, was, I didn't, I didn't know you liked Frank O'Hara. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Which, you know, and I, I said, it's a little bit like not knowing your child is like allergic to bees. Mm -hmm. right. Right. <laughs> or some other major thing about them. Right. Um, but it kind of drove home how we just, we, uh, we had struggled to see each other for a very long time. You write also about, I'm, and I'm curious about this, it, it, you, you know, you write about loving your therapist. Mm. <laughs> I do and, my therapist. And I, I mm. wanted to ask what you make, because many artists and creative people, they're, they're, they fall into one of two camps. Either don't, don't open the door, because that will somehow um, block your creative process or get in the way of it, or root around in there because it will only make it better you know and talk to me about where because it seems like your dad would be in the former camp and you would be in the latter I think that's right that's actually yeah. interesting i never thought about it but yeah i think we um we have very different approaches and mine is to go back um and we actually had this we had a fight about the book night of night of the gun which is probably in this amazing bookstore can i just say yeah. it? <laughs> like, a really phenomenal bookstore um and like so it was this book by David Carr, who was a uh, New York Times reporter, and he went back and reported out for his memoir his addiction and the effect it had on his daughters. And the, the title comes from this moment where he's t interviewing his friend about his own addiction, and you know he says, "Remember that crazy night? And you were like waving the gun around in the car." <laughs> and the friend says, "No, no, no, David, you had the gun." <laughs> <laughs> and so. I love that stuff. I mean, I love that book, and I love that whole idea. I like, I like going back and having like hard conversations, and um, and and trying to, to make amends wherever possible to anything I ever did, and just feeling like I can have a clean slate in my life that I can um, be close to people and feel resolved and all those kind of things. And my father is like, he is the opposite. He does not want to look under the rug at all, and he says it. He says it quite openly um, that he. He just, it's like a third rail um, that his, his memories are like third rails, like rows of them. <laughs> wow. So what do you think it is that makes both of you, you, you have such different processes, you have completely different ways of approaching the world, and you're both incredibly talented. What, what do you think the... I, I don't even know. Like it's just it's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me that you this is what I wanted to ask you about the the therapist. Um because I think this book, so much of this book is like there's something I'll I'll say to my sibling when we're dealing with a particularly different difficult parent, which is don't go to that well. Mm. Stop <laughs> it. You know? And I feel like this book in some way is like, you know, you're repeatedly going to that well and you're looking for an answer, you're looking for a resolution, and you get one and you don't, right? Um, again, is that something you were cognizant of as like a, as a piece of the process? Well, so 
so while I was working on this book, um, my father was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, and my uh, my parents' apartment burned up in a freak electrical fire um, in East Village. A lot of other tragedies also hit. It was like my grandmother died, my father-in-law died, um, sort of one thing after the other, and then COVID hit, like right at the end of those couple months. Uh, I thought my father was dying. Mm -hmm. uh, he was given six months to live, and that was in October 2019, September 2019. Um, and so I thought this is my last chance to actually settle this. He had always been the most fraught relationship in my life, the most difficult, because he wasn't, he's not mean, he's not a bad person, He, um, but he's been very distant and uh, occasionally very cold. He has been cruel, but not on purpose, and it's one of those push-pull relationships that can really get in your head, where you don't really know what you're gonna get at any moment, and it was, it haunted me. It haunted me my whole childhood and then into adulthood, and I thought, this is my chance. I'm gonna like put it to rest, double up on therapy, talk to him, write this book, it's gonna be wonderful for everybody. And I kept trying to write this uh, happy ending for us. You know, mm -hmm. I kept trying to like get him to do the thing that you're supposed to do at the end of a memoir, which mm -hmm. is have the conversation where you're like, I am sorry, and you say, I forgive you, and then scene, right? Like, and I mm -hmm. kept pushing him for that, and he kept not reading the lines I was writing for him. <laughs> and so it, the book winds up being something else. Something and, and and our resolution wound up being something else too. But that's what I love about the book because I think that's way more like life. You know, you think it's not the Hollywood ending. It's not the sort of deathbed. Oh, you know, terms of endearment. I love you. I love you. I love you. And what I also, you know, Ada and I have similar. Uh, uh, our fathers both have similar prognoses. Um, <laughs> but I remember saying to you when you were telling me about this book. And your dad being sick, but like responding to this new immunotherapy, like you're not getting the ending that, you, <laughs> that you're working towards. Like the writer in you, and I think writers will like this is the the part of us that's not the best. Yeah. But it's like you're not giving me my ending. Like you're supposed to, right. you know, exit stage left. Right. And he, did, right? he didn't have to die to give me anything. Right. He needed to be something that was going to be like that was going to feel good to everybody. To it would be satisfying for a reader. Let us right. Say. Um, right. And it would look something like, you're my daughter, I love you, you know, you're whatever, whatever. It would be something really nice. And it was, it was, you know, what, what happened, interestingly, was I finished the book and he loved the book. And so I didn't get the, I didn't get the happy ending inside the book. I had to manufacture a, you know, much, a very honest but um, complicated kind of way of having a happy ending in that book. But, um, but, but then him caring for the book and being cool about the book. Uh, when it is, like you said, it's very candid. It was a book written because I didn't think he would ever read it. Um, right, which frees you up in a way. Uh, what, yes, except may maybe too free. We don't know. Um, <laughs> I, when I gave it to him the first time, but right before it was going to be uh, go to my editor, I was really scared. I didn't think I was ever going to have to do that. I thought he wow. would hate it. And uh, so the fact that he did love the book, it it, it gave us it gave us that kind of closure on that um, that moment that I had always really wanted. Frankly. That's, it's funny because when I got to the end of the book, I thought she, Ada did get her ending. You, uh, to me, you got like your perfect ending because your father says to you after reading the book, I had a passing and then a returning thought that it's the best book I ever read. So you can forgive somebody a whole lot. If they do that. <laughs> <laughs> My guns. Um, you write about women and the cost of creating, and even today, you know, you write about your father sort of having all sorts of roadblocks removed from his way. Your mother did all the heavy lifting. You did a lot of heavy lifting as a child who made yourself as pleasant and easygoing as possible. I was delightful, yeah. And, and <laughs> high achieving and, and very good, uh, you know, and but you write as a woman, you know, what What? What would my creative life have looked like if I had all of those freedoms? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, there's a, there's one point when my son was little, um, I have a 28-year-old stepson and a 15-year-old son, and when my son was like seven, I got, um, got into the McDowell Colony um, in New Hampshire, and I was so excited. I was working on St. Marks Instead, which was my first real book, and, um, and I, I was super excited to go do that. And I 
mention to my parents I was going to go, and my father said, oh, God, a writer's colony? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my mother said to him, your whole life is a writer's colony. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which I appreciated, because the truth is, like, I did write that book and then every subsequent thing, like, with a kid next to me watching Wonder Pets or getting hit with Nerf bullets or, you know, <laughs> like, at the library or, you know, it was, I, it was sort of cobbled together. And my husband, is, who is here, is wonderful. Nothing against him. Like, and, but, but, you know, like, if you have little kids and you, you're sharing all the responsibilities for cooking and cleaning and um, making money and doing all this stuff, you don't have that closed door where you can, like, open it at 5 p.m. and then there's dinner on the table for you and a cocktail. Like, it's, it's not the reality. Uh, and, and it was his reality, and, and I envied it quite a bit. I also wanted to ask you, there's a, a character in the book who you, you give a pseudonym to, Spencer, mm -hmm. who is the aforementioned acolyte of your dad's, mm -hmm. and who becomes this presence in your home. And you write about, as a, even a teenager, I think, you know, coming home and finding that your bedroom has been given over to any one of these sort of Seinfeldian, like Kramer, like interns. They're just <laughs> in your house, they're fans of your it was, dad. It was a constantly recast role. So there, are right. like, there have been 20 of them, right? And it's like played by a different actor every season. Yeah. And Spencer is the latest. And it's um, it reads as this really vivid kind of uh, sibling rivalry that your dad is sort of pitching up here, right? Um, you gave him a pseudonym because you said he's sort of an unintended bystander, in, sort of. Innocent bystander caught in, in family crossfire. He's right. a lovely guy. I mean, he's like totally great, smart. I mean, all, almost all of the ones, that, the people that my father had played this part have been great. I mean, they're like on, on their own, but there's something about the way they get weaponized in the family where it's all kind of about how fantastic they are and sort of everybody else is not as interesting. That's it has become a little toxic. There's a incredible, devastating scene in the book, and it's also, I think, the first scene in which you, in the aftermath, you are palpably angry, and you are, like, owning your anger, and you are like, this. I am justified. Like, you're being terrible. Your dad has been diagnosed, and you're out to dinner, and he says to you, I, I have decided that Spencer is going to be my literary executor. Now, he says this to you while you are in the throes of dealing with Maureen, the gatekeeper, right? <laughs> you know, you understand what literary executors mean, and you say to him, you realize that once you go, if I write about you, which I probably, you probably will, again, I would bet, uh, I have to get his permission to quote you. T talk to me about, like, that moment to me, that was so, like, that was just, it was so, it was, it was brutal, I was angry for you reading it, <laughs> I was, I was so happy you were angry, talk about that. Well, it was also, it was, um, I just spent 20 hours that week not writing but taking him to doctor's mm -hmm. appointments, mm -hmm. and, like, and I also, um, it was at a time when I was working a lot as a ghostwriter, making a lot of money, so I was very proud that I could, like, take him out for dinner every night after our doctor's appointments and sort of, you know, treat him. I was very, feeling very much like this. Uh, again, good girl. I was really, you know, I was doing right by him. I was taking good care of him, and so, uh, so for him to say that at that moment, it was, it was pretty awful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was also just, uh, yeah, because he could have taken the tapes away too. I mean, it, it, the, this person would have right. had um, the tapes, and my aforementioned magical therapist had said when I started the project, "Your father's going to give them to somebody else before you're done." Really. <laughs> And, uh, and then he did. He tried to. He did. But he, 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 he did. He talked about the, it. The, yeah. that, which was also incredible. Yeah. <laughs> did you feel your father softening at all after his diagnosis? Briefly. There was a moment. There was like a... There, I don't know if anybody has like dealt with people who just get these diagnoses where like there's a pink cloud that takes over where they are on the brink of death and or think they are and then they're able to be very honest and open and uh, kind of wonder-filled. And this, I think, lasted like two weeks for my dad, and then after that, it was it shut down again. But in that in that time, we did have some conversations that were very honest. 